Um, my name is Mary Scott, and I am the Chair Emeritus, or the Director Emeritus of the School of Graphic Design. Uh, I am now just teaching. I'm a, just a teacher. And um, I'm happy to say that over the last few years, I've welcomed architects, landscape designers to my class, and you're going to get to see some of the results of what that looks like when um, you put together a portfolio that's designed like a real book. I feel like I have a little credibility uh, to work with architects because I worked for the firm that built the Transamerica building. I actually worked on that presentation and directed all the, the architects in, in doing the graphics for the presentation. So I understand a little bit about plans, elevations, sections, axonometrics, all those bird's eye you know, renderings, all the kinds of stuff that used to be done by hand. I think what drew me to architecture and to work in architecture was I just loved to watch how people could draw. This is back in the day now when everything, there was no, com there were no computers. So anyway, uh, I have a little handout for you, which is just kind of an overview of, of what creating a book is about. I'm going to kind of walk you through it. It's, um, you all know how to use computers, and the students that come to my class, I'm actually kind of drum up business for the fall, actually, because I want more architects. I'd like nothing more than have a whole class full of architects to teach, um, to prepare themselves to go out into the professional world. So the class really has a mission statement, which is to present yourself with your current and potential value as an architect. or designer. Are you all architects? Okay, good. All right, that's a good thing. So, you know, there comes a time when you're finished with your studies that you have to kind of package up everything and be able to take it easily to show someone. And there are many ways you can buy a book that has plastic sleeves and slip in sheets, but there's something magical about books. How many of you have a lot of books? I, I do. I mean, I don't know an architect or a designer who doesn't have a ton of books. We are kind of hardwired to love books. I go to, how many of you go to William Stout? Okay, I, it's dangerous for me to go in there because it's like, it's a very addictive. I, I want to buy everything I see. So I'm going to hand out this and it just tells you a few things uh, just to think about. Um, but basically, you know, just hand, pass them back. Basically, what we want to do, what the goal is to do, is to present your work in a cohesive fashion that's going to enable anyone to see what you're capable of doing. So you all know your projects backwards and forwards, but a stranger, it, and it probably would be an architect who would inter interview you, does not, is not familiar with your work. So you have to organize it in a fashion that they can understand it and walk through it in a logical manner. We also in the class create a website and a complete set of materials, a stationary business card, resumes, one sheets, all the things you're going to need to set up shop and get a job. Um, Mark was just telling me that Nilu Golkari Hog, I think that's how her name is pronounced, is studying for her master's at UCLA right now, and uh, Mark said that her book was one of the things that helped get her accepted. Unfortunately, I only have her book digitally because it's been misplaced, but it's, it's the same size as the other books. I will walk you through the process of how the steps that you go through. I even have some files, some, some native files from one of the students, Ali Reza Arab Shahi, who was my student last year. Um, and he was kind of to give us his uh, files so I could show you little things about layout right here in, in, a, in a live fashion. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to walk you through Nilu's book. So she came to my class with a, a sheet that had all her projects kind of in miniature on them and so I could get a sense of what she was about. And she started the process of kind of putting the work together in a standalone narrative. Just like when you go buy a book at the bookstore, let's say the book is about uh, Frank Gehry. He comes to mind right away. 
um, it's going to it's going to be complete. You don't need Frank Gehry there to explain stuff to you because it has narrative text. It tells you the details, all the things that you're looking at. There's captions, and so everything is clearly communicated. Um, so th the idea of wrapping that up and tying tying it up with a bow of a book is is a very powerful communication because you can go on an interview and you can chat and talk and then someone just takes your book so they're actually I feel it's a very interactive gesture to take someone's book and then you, they start now they're holding your work and they're saying oh what about this this is interesting asking you questions so it's it it sets up a very uh, on, on a conversation in a way that I think is, is very positive. I've heard from all of the former students that, that I've had in the class, Jessica Tangerman, uh, um, F F um, Archer, like Firuz is his last name, uh, Michael Atwell. So it's really great to see that what they've learned has helped them. One student even said that when they went to work for a, an architectural firm, the, the firm made him do a book for themselves like he had done for himself. So it's a skill that will serve you going forward. You'll be able to make a book about anything. You'll just have a few little tips on how to make a book. Now, I couldn't teach somebody to be an architect in 15 weeks, but I can pretty much guarantee that in 15 weeks, if you come to my class, if you were to come to my class, uh, you would walk out with a, a great looking book, you know, assuming that you had some great work to put into it. So we'll look at Nilu's book. Now I'm going to step over here and work this computer. I forgot my little magic pen. So this is a digital representation of Nilu's portfolio. It's about this, it's this exact same size. I don't have it here physically. It's this size, so it's about 12 by 10, 10 and a half by 12. And what's interesting about the, the, the fabrication of this kind of a book is there's a company called Blurb, and they're somewhere here in this, I think they're in New York. You design your book in InDesign, you send, you send your files to them, and lo and behold, this book comes back in the mail, all done printed, bound, ready to go. Uh, a lot of students that, that I teach, graphic design students in particular, they want to do fancy books with fancy bindings, so they'll go another route. But they have to go find a printer, and then they have to find a binder. But this is kind of one-stop shopping, and it's really handy. You can print images on the front and back, and it works just like a real book. It has end sheets um, and all that good stuff. So we're going to walk through Nilo's book. So this is the cover of her book. And she chose one of her experimental models to put on um, the cover. She chose the concept of process for her book, which is something we all use. Everybody understands that. You don't have to name your book, but most books have names. So it's not a bad idea to give your book a name. Uh, as you'll see with Ali's book, it's called Workflow. So the name is part of the process of developing a, a sort of persona for your book. So there's the end sheets, there's her title page. Isn't this cool how the pages just flip? So here is her introduction to a, proce to a project. So up here, right there, she talks about the name of the project, the course, the instructors, and any other details and, and where the site is. So why would we name our instructors in a book like this? What, 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 what would be the reason to do that? Anybody have an idea? Why? Yes, of course. But you might be showing your book to someone who knows this person. And they say, oh, let's see who the instructor is. Oh, I know Paul. I can't read the last name. Jer, 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 Jerigard or something. So there's a, an instant networking and connection that comes up. So it never, it never fails. So that little piece of information, and then this is the name of the project, and this happens to be her thesis. Up here, 
just like in a real book, you have the name of the book. And then over here is her name, Selected Works of Nilo, Nilo Fargo Karihag, and the years. And then over here, on this side, is always the project name. So after I open up this chapter, I will always know where I am. That's called persistent navigation. It just tells you where you are because the un, you know, the, the stranger isn't going to know, oh, I'm still looking at the thesis. Over here, she has a project number. And over here, she has project number. And this is a brief description of the project. Now, if you looked at Michael Atwell's book, he had a lot to say. Most people don't want to write a whole lot. But you can say as much or as little as you want to, or that is necessary to make someone understand what the objective of this project was. She also chose the notion of showing herself at work. So these hands that you see are Nilu's hands. And now she unveils the project. So this navigation that I talked about stays there forever. And <clears throat> if you'll notice, there is what we call a, there are margins on the book. These margins are the same on top and side, but they're slightly deeper on the bottom. That's a choice you make, but margins are a really good thing. And once you see how a mar set of margins will organize a book, um, you'll also see that we decide where to put things and then we stay there. We don't, things just don't float around arbitrarily. So I'm just going to go on a few spreads, and I'll point out a couple things. So these captions are geared to these, these elements right here. So each thing has a little number on it and tells you what the, uh, what the caption is. Because it's nicer than putting captions right under pictures. It's more, it's more artful. So these are some of the parts of the process. So one of the most difficult things to embrace for most architects or interior designers is negative space on a page. It frightens most people because, like, why should, why should that be blank? Well, negative space is a very important thing in design. And you know that in your architecture. You have to have negative space or else you couldn't stand in it. So a negative space in, in print design is, um, is really important. And also, what's important is to pace the images that you show. So we're not looking at the same thing all the time. Now we're looking at, we're looking at one type of sketch and some kind of close-up. Here again is our captions. And once you've set a style for the captions, you use that all the way through. Here's our little numbers, which tie into the captions. And, you know, and then sometimes, Photographs will bleed. So bleed means the image runs off the page. But notice, sometimes they don't. So that, again, is a choice you make, depending on what looks best. And most of the time, it looks really great to have margins around images. I think in this case, it works really well. And I, I hope you can appreciate the balance of the page. Instead of these things being across, we, we leave some nice negative space here. We stack these elements, and then we have the large image. So there's contrast between scale. There's small things, and there's large things. And that's just a particular uh, habit of, of book design, is to, to have show contrast. And then here we have a big bleed image going across two pages, which is a spread. Um, so what you're not seeing here is the gutter in the book. The gutter would be right about here, this, which means is where the, that's where the book opens up. Um, these are photographs of her models that she took, more models. And now here's another chapter, which looks the same, except the pictures change. And this is Nilu on one of those windows, probably out there at the front, uh, doing some tracing. So rough sketches, sketches of all sorts, important. Whatever it is necessary to tell the story. Um, I was very proud to hear that Nilu got accepted 
at UCLA because it has a really incredible reputation. I went to school there for a while, and um, it's a you know it's 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 rewarding. And so here's Nilu again. Now she's working on something else. She was actually inspired by a book that one of our graphic design students did. She saw it and she said, "I love the idea of." putting myself to work and, and you know actually showing that I'm actually using my hands. So these are little studies. So you, what's nice about this is you get to put many things in that if you had to use boards or some other way of showing the work, it wouldn't be as, as facile as this. Does anybody have any questions? No. Oh, looks easy, doesn't it? Well, you know, there's an old saying, good design looks effortless. That doesn't mean it is effortless. Just like a beautiful building should look effortless, but we all know it takes a lot of effort to do. So on and on and on and on and on. There she is again. So you set up a system by which the reader who doesn't know your work or doesn't know you automatically sees I'm going from one project to another. So there is a, um, there's a, 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 a visual cue to tell me that I'm looking at a new project, whereas if they all kind of just went together, you wouldn't know that. Now, you don't, do you have to take pictures of yourself for your portfolio? Not at all. She chose to do that because she thought that would be a good way to present herself. Okay. So the, the good thing is, um, and, and for the most case, there's not a lot of information that you have to deal with. The, simple, the simpler the layout is, the better. And, it, and, and what usually is problematic with the way that people who haven't been trained to use typography cor correctly, they don't know all the subtle little details. And later I'll show you on a, on a native file just the difference in setting type with a certain set of specs and another set makes it look better. Just it's that simple. Uh, because there's lots of rules about setting type. Um, it has more rules than you can shake a stick at. So there we go. So it's it's a lovely, it's, I, I think it's a really lovely book. And um, very proud to have had Nilu in class. She was, she was very, very um, wonderful to teach, and as so as the other students. And at the end of the book, we always thank everybody who helped us finish all this up, meaning your studies, your friends, your family, your teachers. Saying thank you is one of the best things that you can do in life because it doesn't cost you anything, and it get, it, it gets you so much. It, it, you know, many times teachers will see our students' portfolios and they'll say, oh, they thank me, you know, and they feel so good. So, and um, a colophon is all the details of a book. It's a, it's a book term. And what that is, it tells the school, the course, um, the book binder, the photographer. She gives credit to the photographer who took her pictures, um, the stock that the book was printed on, the text stock, the cover stock, the fonts that she used. She used Franklin Gothic and um, book medium demi heavy. There's, there's some great faces that I think are good for these books. One of the things that a lot of people do that haven't studied typography is they think, I'm going to use a cool typeface. Well, cool typefaces are not where it's at. It's using classic type in a very, very um, systematic way. Um, and that's the back of her book with her finishing. Um, so if you want, just pop out of your seats and I'll show you physically a book. So um, like I said, along with this book, um, the materials that everyone needs, even if you're in, you know, applying for an internship, is you need a resume. Well, first of all, you need to be able to mail something to someone. So we create a system for this. She even made her own stamps, which you can do easily. And I don't know why this isn't coming out. Here we go. So there's her resume. 
I want you to notice something that the type inside her book and the resume are cut from the same piece of cloth, meaning they're a system. She's used Franklin Gothic, and she's mimicked all of the same attributes with some you know, slight changes. There's her business card. I don't want to unclip it because it's impossible to get it back. Um, and here she made a list of all the firms she wanted to work for or apply to. Here's her letterhead, which is the same as her resume. And then these are the one sheets. A lot of people want to see a one sheet before they'll even give you an interview. So this is, again, using her same typography and grouping. This is not as aesthetically, um, I would say, sparse as this is. It's just crammed with the information that needs to be there. So you would do one of these for every project in my class. Okay, So there you are. Um, so then each, so we got up to about here, I think. Where did we get in the book? Yeah, we got past here. So as you go through the book, you see different print. We got, we got past that. Let me see if I can start at the next project. So each chapter beginning shows her, there's a lot of her roughs. Sometimes that's important to show how your process works. Um, so each time she begins a new project, we get a new picture of her. I can't, this is a long, and there's no rule about how long a chapter is. It's as long as it needs to be, okay? If it's a very complex project, then it's going to be a lot of spreads. But everything is pristinely presented. It's clean, it's easy to understand, there's no confusion. Um, and the, the, the margin creates the continuity in the book, just like in a building. You don't make the windows all different sizes, unless you're Frank Gehry or one of those guys. Um, but there's, there's a process. So everything has its place and sits where it belongs, which gives you a palette that you, where you can show the work. Looks pretty easy, doesn't it? Good design always looks effortless. Good architecture looks effortless, but we know it's not effortless, right? It takes a lot of effort to design. So there's an opportunity with each page to change the pace. Here she is doing yet another thing. And then on the back cover, she chose to put her doing her work. She did an interesting thing with her photographs also. When she first brought them to me, they were too colorful. I said, just desaturate the color. So they're, they're very muted. They're not, you know, real bright, colorful photographs. They're a little bit more toned down. But um, one of the things that uh, is, is very important in, in design is uh, addressing the edges of the page. We call this the envelope of the design. And you sometimes call buildings envelopes. Things never look good when they're floating. Notice this is not centered in this space. It's tucked up to the top to give this negative space. OK? So we can now move on to a different person's work. Ali Reza Arab Shahi was my student. And he is now working at a place in Venice. And I forget what it's called. But it's a cool, Venice, huh? Venice, California, not Venice, Italy. <laughs> um, also, something that you probably have never done before is as you're designing a book, you make thumbnails of every single spread. So you can see we do this before we finish the book to make sure that we don't have two of these right next to each other, that you have this next to something like that. So there's some breathing room. So that white space is really um, room to allow you to appreciate the work. How many of you have looked at a lot of architectural books? They use a lot of negative space. I have probably, I'm, I'm a real fan of architecture. I'm probably, I probably secretly want to be an, architecture, uh, an architect. I used to say when I worked for 
an architect that someday I wanted to go back to school and learn architecture, but obviously I didn't do that. Um, so this is Ali's book, and we're going to take a look at that real quickly. So let's, let's zoom into this spread. Okay. So I'm going to set this type. I'm going to copy this type and put it over here, and I'm going to set it really badly <laughs> so you can see the difference. Now, I'm not saying that none of you know how to set type, but whoops, what, oh, I don't know. What's the, what's the, it's Apple C, Apple V, but what is copy? Is it Alt C? Alt C. Oh, control. What's control? Alt? Oh, control. Sorry for my ignorance here. And then control V for copy? Okay, there we go. All right, I'll do it right next to it. All right, so when you're setting type that's all the same size, you don't want to have too much distance between things. This little guy right here is called a hairline. So he's just put that in there for, it's a detail you can do with type. But let's say he wasn't paying much attention to the way he set this, and he set it maybe like this. This is now tracked at 50. That sounds like a whole big number, but it's not. So I'm going to track it at zero. And now look what happened. It got all kind of bunched together. And then sometimes what people do is they'll set body copy with too much tracking. That's, that's not even, that's not terrible yet. I gotta make it really terrible. It's hard for me to do that. I feel like I'm, see, so that's, you never want type to look like that. Because notice how hard it is to read compared to the type right next to it. There's too much space between the letters, and conversely, there's not enough space between the lines because <clears throat> the distance between the lines is called leading, and that's controlled by this little guy up here. This one? Oh, I have to scroll over it. It's not going to let me do that, but I can change the distance between the lines here. See? So. You might like to, this is called very loose letting. So if you wanted to do that, you'd have to go back and take in the, the tracking, which is this little guy here, and it'll probably look okay. It's just a different feel. So what we call these two things is the way the type colors. So this one looks darker than that one, right? Because it's more dense. So those are just little things that um, you know, you, if you know those things, you always want to consider the, the tracking. And um, that's this control right here. I don't know what VA stands for, but that's, that's where you change that number. Uh, conversely, you never want to track body copy too tight because, okay, that's not tight enough yet. So, well, let's make it disgustingly tight. See how it just all, it, it doesn't read well because now the letters are actually touching each other. Back in, you know, the hand typesetting days, the reason they call it leading is they would put pieces of lead between the lines of type to space them. That's, and they were actually lead, so that's why that's called, called that. Um, let's, let's go forward and look at some of the display type. So now, I don't think the font is loaded, because this is not, OK, so the font isn't loaded, because this is DIN. So this is some default font. It's saying it's DIN right up here. Um, so for example, sometimes you want to make something, maybe, oh, he doesn't have the bold. So let's, let's make it light. Oops, he doesn't have light either. Oh, Control Z, is that to bring it back? Yes. Um, so you can control the size of things um, very easily. Notice how instead of putting lots of space be or, or between these um, rectangles of images, we've grouped them. Our brains are 
hardwired to see groups more so than things spread out. So if I put these, like, I, I mean, I think it's a much more pleasing um, layout to have them grouped together all at the same interval than like that. But there may be a reason why you'd have to put captions here right underneath them. But in most cases, if something is clear enough, I mean, I think any architect would understand what that was. Here he says it's a, di it's a concept diagram. Well, I can sort of tell that, but it's nice to have little details. But we'll put it back the way it was. Okay. Um, you might decide to say, well, what would happen if I made this bigger? Now, I don't know the... If you want to make something bigger and you don't want it to change proportion, what keys do you... Hit. Does anybody know? Because I only know on, on Apple. Alt and what? Okay. Oh, shift. All right, there we go. So I might say, well, well maybe I want to line it up with that. But the thing you have to remember is once you set your margin at the top, you don't vary it or if you vary it, it's really different. It's, it's maybe down here instead of up there. You don't want to just change it a little bit because that's what creates the, the visual organization to the book. Okay? So, um, you know, and you might say, well, what if I bled this into the gutter? Would that look better? I don't know. You, have to, you know, you can try things. Oh, but shouldn't I line this up with that? Isn't that just natural to say, oh, if that's where my line is? So now I've created a unity between these elements because this, this, the page, while it's two pages, it's one thing because it's seen all at once. So when you're designing facing pages, you always want to design them as if they are one thing, even though they could be many things. Does that make sense? Yes? No? Oh, okay, great. All right, what else can I show you? So, you know, here um, uh, he's added uh, a little set of numbers, and that just tells me I'm on project one, and then the next time I go to project two, the little brackets are going to be around the two, and they're going to sort of move. So it's little details, and, you know, you might think, oh, what, who cares about all those little details? You know, Charles Eames, who's one of my favorite designers, always said, the details are not the details. The details are the product. It's like a, you can design a beautiful building, but if somebody puts it together poorly and crafted and doesn't pay attention to detail, it looks terrible. So everything is true of anything that you make, furniture and, and any product that has to be designed and produced well. So the idea of putting detail into your presentation elevates your work a whole lot. It really does. It, it, has, it has a way of making it look even better than it might be because you've carefully addressed the different facets of it. You've organized it. So what you've done is you've taken this stack of work that you've done in what five years you guys your programs five years right well my, my students sometimes go to school five years too so <laughs> they can't always finish in four but your program is is five years and it, it's a lot of work and to show it and honor it in a way that you know is good is is a good thing so let's look at ollie's website do you have any questions about any of this so if you take a few minutes when you have some free time, I'm sure you have a lot of that, um, and go on issue, you can go through these books page by page and look at them and see what they did and um, appreciate you know, just the, the delivery of the information. But I'm, yeah. Um, so if you're like on one of those types that has a lot of trouble with white plays, how do you uh, deal with I that? beat it out of you. <laughs> no, no, you, you know, you, huh? Oh, the question that he asked, what's your name? 
Matthew. Matthew asked the question, what if you have a problem with leaving a lot of white space or open space? Um, it's, it actually, negative space helps the design. People think they just have to fill up a page with every, you know, fill every square inch. And what happens when you do that, and it, 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 it's okay to do that when the things are all very similar, but if you put a, make a page with, you know, different sized things and, and different elements, you violate the signal to noise ratio principle, which means there's too much going on. So you gradually learn that the white space um, is, is, a, you know, is your friend. Like here, do you, do, would that be hard for you to leave that much space there that you see there? Huh? Oh, well, it's kind of one of those things you have to get over. Yeah, it's, it's because you're not, and I know on all your presentation boards for different projects, every square, the same thing with the industrial design students. They have to fill every square inch. But when you're doing this, you want to make it more of, you know, you want to make it a beautiful artifact. And a beautiful design, you know, makes it more of an artifact. You, you could learn to embrace it. It's not going to change. It's not going to hurt you. It will allow your your presentation to be able. Like I can look at that, and I can look at this floor plan, and I have some breathing room. So all the white space is for visual breathing room. But sometimes we don't leave any white space. I think there's a spread in here that goes right across the whole th there. There's no. The, the white space or negative space is within the drawing itself. But there's the whole, every square inch of the page is filled, but it looks good. So it depends on what you're showing also. So you just have to learn to, to, to uh, change the pace because what happens when you go from large scale to small scale just visually, it creates movement and more interest. If everything was exactly the same size and exactly the same way, you, you wouldn't want to keep going. Books are meant to be leafed through because they're interesting. So you want to engage someone in looking at your work. But that's a good question. Um, let me see. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can find Ali's website. I gotta look it up. Um, alireza-r.com. So, okay, so there's Ali's website. I guess this is just like, this is a rollover, so this just sort of automatically rolls over. So now if I want to see his projects, I click on that and I can pick a project. These are called rollovers. Okay, so now I, if I click on this, I get that project and it tells me all about that project in detail, just like in the book. But let's say I wanted to get an overview, and, I, and um, I'm going to show you his. Are any of you doing thesis? Yes? OK, I'll show you his thesis book in a minute. So here's his portfolio, which you just saw on issue. You embed that into your website, so then they could see your portfolio. <coughs> they want to. You're just giving people options, which is nice. Everybody likes options. Um, how do I get back to? How do I go back here? Okay, here we go. I want to go back to his website. Um, do I have to go to, oh, here we go. All right, let's look at his thesis book. So Ali took a lot of the things that he learned in the class, and he was actually doing his, his uh, book uh, in tandem with his portfolio. 
So he kept it very simple. Um, see, now here I'd have to say he said his type, this type is set too loosely. There's too much space between individual letters on this. He forgot to use his same settings from his book, but I'll forgive him for that. So um, he might have had a, a, a start on this before he started taking portfolio. I've never actually physically seen his uh, thesis, so I guess there's a lot to put, put in that. All right, so you can also see that he found some fun um, stock photography. So if we were to look at, I, I don't think Samantha has her website up, and I, and I wonder if uh, um, Nilu would, but everyone comes out of, of, the, of the deal with, with the website, all the materials, everything you need to go to, to go get an interview. So um, I'd love to answer some questions if you have some. You're very quiet. No questions? Um, well, I, I guess we might be finished then. I'm happy to talk to any of you individually, or if you want to stay and look at some more stuff, we can look at some more stuff together. But uh, basically, uh, what I've sort of mapped out for you is, is that it's not difficult to design a book that looks like a professional designer designed it. You can, you can very easily, with just a few moves, knowing how to make, and after a while, it just sort of comes naturally. After you do it on several projects, you can just apply that to anything that you're doing. Okay? So, very good. Thank you.